Shabbat Shalom, family and friends. We are on the 31st Torah portion, uh, named Emor, which means say. It takes place in Leviticus chapter 21 through chapter 24. It also includes the reading of the prophets in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 15 through 31, and in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10. So the Torah portion starts off with rules for the priests. The priests were set apart for service to God, and so they had special rules about how to live and interact with others. For example, a priest couldn't make himself ceremonially unclean by touching the dead body unless it was a close relative. Priests also couldn't marry just anyone. They couldn't marry a former prostitute or a woman that was divorced from her husband. Then there were high priests. So high priests were the highest rank of priests. And the high priest had even more qualifications. For example, he couldn't make himself ceremoni ceremonially unclean by touching a dead body, even if it was his father or mother. Unlike a regular priest that could touch, you know, the dead body of a close relative, the high priest couldn't touch any dead body, period. Also, the high priest had to marry a virgin. So not to profane his children, which means he couldn't, he could, he not only couldn't marry a prostitute, a former prostitute or a divorced woman, he couldn't marry a widow also. Now, this is why Yeshua had to be born from a virgin. I mean, because it says that high priest had to marry a virgin, so not to profane his children. And we have here Yeshua who is our new high priest from the line of Melchizedek, he had to be born of a virgin. Now, there's another level of service to the Lord, and that's the high priest that offer food to Yah. So these priests that perform sacrifices could not have any defects. Like they couldn't be blind, they couldn't be lame, they couldn't be disfigured or deformed or have a broken foot or arm. They couldn't be hunchbacked, dwarfed. They couldn't have a defective eye, a skin sore or scabs. Now, the priests that did have such a defect, they could partake in eating the food, but they couldn't perform the sacrifices themselves. And this makes sense when you think about how perfect the animals in the sacrifice had to be, the high priest that offered them also had to be close to perfection. I mean, God wanted to be as close to perfection as possible when the sacrifice was offered. Another thing to consider is that if Yeshua is our high priest, and he also is our Passover lamb, he would need to be without defect for both roles. In chapter 22, it outlines how the animal presented for offering must be without defect. There's also special rules, like if a bull or lamb has a leg that is too long or too short, it may be offered as a voluntary offering, but it may not be offered to fulfill a vow. Chapter 23 is one that many of us know very well. This chapter lays out our appointed times with Yah. You think about the fact that we make special times to honor loved ones or events that occurred, like wedding anniversaries, birthdays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Thanksgiving, President's Day, Martin Luther King Day, and such. We still make new appointed times with doctors, with uh, for doctor's appointments, hairstylists, uh, even at work. And although most of these appointed times mostly involve sacrifices, don't think of it as torturing animals for a bloodthirsty God. Think of it as a family reunion 
a church picnic, a birthday party, where food is always involved with meat and corn on the grill. And I do find it interesting that the Sabbath, out of these appointed times, does not really involve uh, a, a burnt offering or an animal sacrifice. Now, there are daily sacrifices spelled out in Exodus 29 so that God can live among his people. But there is no special sacrifice, animal sacrifice, that is, for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of complete rest for the people. And it is to be observed wherever you live. Yeshua says in Mark 2, verse 27, that Sabbath was made for man. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13, the Lord encourages us to think of the Sabbath as a delight, as honorable. Now, I do find interesting in chapter 24 that the Lord commands Israel to bake 12 loaves of bread from choice flour to be laid out every Sabbath. The bread is to be received from the people of Israel as a requirement of the eternal covenant. The bread was to serve as a representative offering, a special gift presented to the Lord. Isn't it interesting that Yeshua calls himself the bread of life? In John 6, verse 35, Yeshua says specifically, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not be hungry, and the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. Matthew 26, verse 26 states, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then we have Matthew 12, where this bread, the show bread, is referenced, but specifically after Yeshua's disciples were accused of breaking the Sabbath. Yeshua notes how David ate of his bread when he and his companions were hungry. And then in verse 8 of Matthew 12, Yeshua notes that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeshua is that special gift presented to the Lord. And if we look at it, all feasts point to Christ in some form or fashion. So for Passover, Yeshua was the lamb without blemish or defect that was crucified for our sins to escape death. The Feast of Unleavened Bread points to Messiah's sinless life. Yeshua's body was in the grave during the first days of this feast, like a kernel of wheat planted and waiting to burst forth, which leads us to first fruits, which points to Christ's resurrection. The Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, points to the great harvest of souls that the message of Yeshua is gathering together in his name. The Feast of Trumpets points to when Yeshua will appear in the heavens as he comes for his bride, the church, Israel. The Day of Atonement, where many will look upon Yeshua, whom they have pierced, repent of their sins, and receive him as their Messiah. Then there is the Feast of Tabernacles, which points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle with his people when he returns to reign over all the world. The Torah portion ends with a peculiar story of a half-Egyptian, half-Israelite man that gets into a fight with an Israelite man, and during the fight, he blasphemes the name of the Lord with a curse. 
They keep this man in custody until the Lord's will in the matter becomes clear. The Lord tells Moses to take the blasphemer outside the camp. All that heard the curse laid their hands on his head, and then the entire community stoned him to death. One thing this illustrates is that the sin of blaspheming was so severe that those that heard it needed to lay their hand on his head, like how a priest would lay their hands on an animal prior to sacrifice. The word curse here is also mentioned in Leviticus 20. Uh, if there's anyone who curses his father and mother, he shall certainly be put to death. He cursed the name of the Lord, and this word is also translated as low. In fact, the first time it's used in the Bible is when Noah sent out a dove to see if the water was low. So one lesson here is that we are to exalt Yah's name and not make low of it, keeping his feasts and following his commandments to the best of our ability is how we can exalt Yah's name. As we enter a new week, let's be mindful of how we can exalt Yah's name. Shabbat Shalom.